Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Pointy Not Sharp. Today we're taking a look at the M9 bayonet designed to fit the M16 rifle. Uh, it will fit a number of different rifles. It'll fit anything that's designed to take the M7 because it has the exact same uh, connection device down here as the, the M7. So it'll fit you know, your Mossberg shotguns, your Australian F88, your M4s, your uh, any of the other rifles around the world designed to take the M7 like the uh, Indonesian uh, SS1. So it'll fit a number of rifles. Now, these were manufactured by a couple of different companies. This is actually a Buck manufacturer and Buck made them very, very early on and not for very long. They also made a number of commercial ones and they also made a couple for uh, the US military, well, quite a few for the US military and uh, a couple for the Australian army and a few for a few other, uh, other countries like um, Abu Dhabi and that. But uh, these M9 bayonets were made by Smith & Wesson, uh, Probus, uh, Buck Knives, as we have just here, uh, Lanke, and Ontario. So generally, you'll find the manufacturer's markings on the recastos of the blades. And that's generally how you know who you've got. Obviously, you've got a buck. Um, the great thing about the buck is it also says it on the scabbard. You might also notice something else down there. I'll explain that later. See there. All right, so the history of this bayonet, uh, it was made to replace the M7. So the uh, the US used the M7 for the M16 when it was first introduced. And I've got an M7 uh, just here. It is an Australian one, or Australian scabbard at least. As you can see, it's a little uh, dagger style blade like the um, prior bayonets, like the M5, the M6, the M4, all those. But the M9 here is designed to be more of a uh, utility, survival, uh, utilitarian kind of knife, really. Uh, and it was modeled a little bit after the AKM bayonets that the uh, the, uh, the Soviets were using. I've got one of those here. So, different style of blade, but um, you can see he's got the same wire cutter at the front as you have on the M9 here as well as the sawback, although this is a polished one, usually your AK bayonets have a sawback here as well. So the M9, it's a bit of a copy of the um, AK bayonets. Put this AK bayonet away. So this particular one here, as I said, is a buck, and this was actually made under contract for Australia. So as you can see, we've got an Australian broad arrow just in here and uh, down here on the scabbard as well. There are only about 20,000 of these made, but they were used uh, in conjunction with the M7. So prior to ordering these in our batch of M7s, we were using uh, SLR bayonets uh, for the SLR, obviously. We bought um, a number of M7s as uh, training bayonets to uh, use at uh, Kapuka and School of Infantry and other training schools where they got absolutely used and abused on the bayonet assault courses. And then when you actually get to a unit, you get issued one of these bad boys. So when I got, um, I was in the infantry myself and when I rocked up to my unit, I got issued one of these and um, I gotta say, we didn't like them too much. Uh, absolutely fantastic knife, razor sharp, utilitarian, handy sawback, great wire cutter. Uh, but that's not the reason we didn't like them. The reason we didn't like them is because they are absolutely massive and very, very bulky a bit heavier than they need to be. So when you compare it to the M7, which I'll place next to it, yeah, there's a bit of a difference in the blade, but the blade wasn't so much the issue as the scabbard. So the scabbard was a massive pain in the ass. That scabbard is absolutely huge. It's bulky. Uh, it uses a wire hanger. So it just didn't sit on your equipment right. Like, um, generally you wouldn't get issued your bayonet until you're going away in a field exercise, kind of like uh, with a weapon. And um, you'd have your gear the way you liked it in training for uh, doing all your drills around base. Then you go field, you get given this big bulky bayonet to attach to your webbing. Now, it's got a wire hanger, it doesn't have molly. So the first big issue is how you're attaching your wire hanger to your molly, not very well. Uh, then you probably don't have much space uh, set aside for it. And then you got your actual scabbard piece just flopping around everywhere. And it's so big and bulky, it was just a pain in the ass. It was always in the way. It wasn't particularly uh, well liked. 
And then we weren't even allowed to use the, the bayonets as like a utility knife because um, they were scared that we were going to break them or dull them or wear them out before we ever deployed overseas, which uh, never happened while I was there. And uh, when the unit did deploy overseas, I don't think they even took them. Uh, anyway, um, my rambling aside, we'll get into the actual construction of the blade. So I'm not certain what the actual material of the blade is, but it seems to be pretty corrosion resistant. Um, it's got a fuller on uh, one side of the blade, very, very sharp blade. Uh, got the saw back, got the, the wire cutter here, so same as the AKs. I'm sure you've probably seen this demo a million times by now, but just goes over that notch and snip, snip, snip. That's locked up pretty good on me. Then moving down, we've got a little cross guard with a hole down the bottom, not sure why, uh, muzzle ring. Got a plastic uh, grip or handle. And then we have the exact same pommel as what you'll find on the M7, retained by a screw. So internally, another issue I have with this bayonet is the tang is absolute shit. The tang only comes down to about where my finger is now. Uh, and it screws into a tube, which goes all the way down the bottom and attaches to the pommel. Now I've got two issues with that. The first is you lose a lot of strength because you don't have a long solid tang. And secondly, if you're not gonna have a long tang, um, at least have something that gives you uh, a bit of protection from electricity because you've completed the circuit all the way down to the pommel. So if you're cutting electrified wire, you can still run a current through yourself, whether the AK bayonets, they isolated their metallic pommel from their cross guards. So while their tang is short as well, it's not attached to the pommel. There's no direct connection, so it's uh, isolated. You can hold onto that and you won't electrify yourself. So if you're gonna have a short tang, it, at least isolate it. Like I think that's a bit of a design flaw there. Anyway, I'm a bit biased towards it because I had to uh, lug it around. I didn't particularly like it when I was in. Um, now that I'm collecting bayonets, they're quite desirable and they're worth a fair chunk of money. And I don't know, I've warmed up from a bit because I've done a bit of research, but we'll jump into the scabbard. Little pouch on the front. Uh, when I was in, we used to keep an extra sharpening stone in there, but we didn't really use it. Then you've just got a really firm plastic scabbard. Wire cutter down the end. On the back here, behind this clip, you have your sharpening stone. Oh, God, that's tight. You got your slits down the sides here as well, so you can run um, a belt or something through there to connect it to your leg or what have you. I'm sure there's better ways to connect it like they've done here, but. And then moving up to the frog. Uh, so you got the strap to retain the bayonet inside. That just clips on there. Uh, you've got your um, clip to disconnect, so you can use it as a wire cutter while this is still connected to your webbing. And obviously just your wire hanger and your um, little connector for your handle up the top. Now the markings on these blades, uh, all the different manufacturers obviously have their manufacturing details on the Ricasso. Now initially when this uh, blade was designed back in um, 86 and put in production in 87, they didn't have the pattern straight away. So there were a lot of copies made uh, straight off the bat. Then a couple of years later they got onto patents, but um, you still get copies coming out of China. Um, some of the copies aren't terrible, but most of them aren't great. Generally the copies you'll find like a, a number instead of a manufacturer's name. So all the main manufacturers you have, Smith & Wesson, Probus, Buck, Lancan, Ontario, they'll all have their manufacturer's name or details across there. And it'll probably say USA as well. Um, it's got a number 188 under Buck. I'm not sure if that's a serial number or if that's a, I don't know, a batch number or a pattern number, I don't know what that is. If you know a comment below, I'd love to hear from you. And then the Australian uh, broad arrow next to it, which is a government acceptance mark. And you've got nothing on the reverse, nothing on the spine, nothing on any other part of the bayonet. So nothing um, imprinted on the handle like you have on the um, US Marine OKC. And then moving down on the back of the wire hanger, there's a stack of markings in here. 
So you've got uh, Bianchi, International, Universal Military Holster, US and Foreign Patents Pending. And the scab down here, just a buck in the Government Acceptance Mark again, the uh, broad arrow. And on the re uh, reverse here, you've got a stack more markings on the back of the plastic here. Um, so you've got to focus. So ITW Nexus, uh, Wooddale, Illinois with a postcode. And then just patent numbers and details down the bottom. Nothing terribly exciting. So I'll move my scabbard out of the way. You can actually disassemble these pretty well, and I can show you what I mean when I say it's uh, not electrically isolated. So, let's get my Allen key. And the pommel comes off pretty easy. The screw comes straight out. The pommel pops off. It's got those two, two little plugs that fit into the back of the handle. Handle comes out, and this is the metal tube I was talking about. So this screws onto the back of the tang here. I pre-loosened this one, it's usually a bit tight, and you might need a um, pair of grips to get it off. Off comes the cross guard, and you can see what I mean about that short tang. Like that, that is very, very short. And um, this is not providing any uh, electrical isolation whatsoever. It's in direct contact with the pommel. So unlike the AK bayonets, I wouldn't be cutting electrified wire with these. So sorry if this seemed like a little bit of a negative review. Um, my view of this bayonet is a bit tainted from my time in the service. And um, I'm probably just a bit dirty because I'd uh, carry it around. It was big, it was bulky. It uh, slapped me in the leg a million times. Probably gave me... Um, couple of bruises and uh, yeah, a couple of hot spots, rubbing spots. But look, it's a great knife and it does have a good reputation. A lot of people love it. Um, I've seen a million good reviews for it as a hunting survival knife. Very, very big in pop culture. You see it in all your, uh, all your games, like um, pretty much any game where someone's got a, a combat or survival knife these days, they're using one of these. So look, it does have a bit of a cult following and it is pretty well deserved. It is a very, very good knife, uh, despite my personal distaste for it. But uh, yeah, so if you know anything else about it or have missed anything or made any uh, grievous errors, guys, please feel free to comment below. Um, if you'd like to see more of this kind of content, please let me know as well or uh, like and subscribe. Um, just let me know what you'd like to see and I'm more than happy to try and uh, track pieces down and... Um, make uh, make some videos and uh, put some photos up on Instagram as well. All right, guys, thanks for watching.